Okay, here we go. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time of day it is. I hope it's good to be where you are because it's good to be here. My name is Baltimore Fats, and this is the continuation of Mud City. Nailed it. Okay. Uh, okay, I gotta react quicker to that. <laughs> All right. So here we go. Picking up where we left off. Um, Charles Carroll, the settler, had two children. Um, one of which was Charles Carroll of Annapolis. Because as I'm going to be saying ad nauseum, there's just too many Charleses. There's just too many of them. Um, and again, I almost believe that that's, you know, on purpose. You know, they, there's so many Charleses in here that it's hard to keep their story straight. And who, and who Charles, which Charles belongs to which family and... You know, it gets, it's, it, 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 you know, it's really a mind bender. Um, so we have Charles Carroll of Annapolis, right? The eldest son of the settler. The other uh, son, uh, Daniel, goes on um, to father two children. So the grandchildren of, the three grandchildren that they talk about of uh, Charles Carroll, the settler, are all major players in the American Revolution. They all, all three of them are. Well, uh, two of them are, and one of them becomes the first Roman Catholic bishop of Maryland. Um, so I'm um, just, I mean, the power players coming out of the Carroll family and this, you know, uh, third generation, I guess, Carrolls, they, I mean, it's set up that way. Uh, they all go to schools in England and you know, they all uh, go to like Oxford and Cambridge and things like this. So they don't really say much about him on Wikipedia here. Um, they do give uh, some brief information about his life, but mostly they repeat the stuff about his dad. And, um, you know, he says, like many sons of wealthy Marylanders, he was sent to England to study law, but returned after his father's death in order to inherit the family's estates. So they're going over there. They're part of these middle temples and inner temples and, all, you know, it's all c connected people, right? And um, there, there's his mom there, like I said, and his, and, uh, his grandfather, Carol of Annapolis, his grandfather, hugely uh, important player in early Maryland. Um, so they talk about his legacy, but it, the biggest legacy that he offers is that he's the father of Charles Carroll of Carrollton, who we'll get into. All right, so now, moving along, I want to try to, I don't want to hop right to Charles Carroll of Carrollton when there's Charles Carroll, the barrister, to talk about. Now, this guy is hugely important, hugely important. Um, he may be, actually, the most important one of them all. Um... And it's his property. This is how the whole, all of Falcon's Maze starts here with this guy. Um, because it's his property that the B&O Railroad Museum, uh, the, the first B&O Railroad Station, uh, Mount Clare Station, was built on. It's his property. Um, and so when I was doing that initial, when I was looking at those early maps of um, Locust Point and seeing the railroad track there and connecting it to the removal of mud and the, and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and so I wanted to do like a history of the railroad, the history of the B&O Railroad, and it, well, since it's on his property, I figured that that was the best place to start. But like I said, when I started looking at him, it just kept drawing me deeper, so I wanted to start with like the first English sort of, said, you know, not settlers, but you know, yeah, the first English settlers and of the region and bring it through Baltimore because John Smith did come up into Baltimore via the Patapsco River. Um, and I figured that was the best place to start. And it's brought me back to the Tudors, and it's going to bring me back even further in a minute. I mean, it, it, the story just continues to unfold. Um, all right, so they say he was an American statesman from Annapolis and builder of the colonial home Mount Clare in 1760. And Mount Clare is where the railroad station is. Um, and he was a delegate to the Second Continental Congress in 76 and 1777. You know, player, right? Definitely. And especially once we get into his house, this Carol, uh, Mount Clare. Um, there it is. Um, when we get into that, 
you know, the things that went on in that house, um, you know, and the people that went in and out and around and through, you know, they were cooking the books to be sure. So, you know, it says he, he's a descendant because his father isn't listed. It's not, his father isn't Charles Carroll, the settler, right? He's another Carroll, right? And so I want to, so it says early life is a descendant of the last Gaelic lords of, I don't know how you would even say that, Ely, uh, Ely in Ireland, um, you know, sorry for any Irish people out there that I just butchered that as I'm butchering this history. <laughs> um, so, so he goes to London, right? You know, and he studies at the Middle Temple, Temple, like I was saying. Um, but let's see where I was. Oh, so it was the last words of, uh, of Ireland, right? You know, and he spent six years at the English house in Portugal. So he's, you know, his father sent him who, but, who was his father? Also Charles Carroll. And so I was like, uh, you know, I was like, damn, another Charles, right? So you read through his history here a little bit. They talk about how he goes and he studies law as all these Carrolls study law. You know, why do they study law? Because they're about to write the laws that uh, the future America is going to be based on. Um So then it says his father died in 17, 1755, right? Three months after his father died, leaving Charles at 32, one of the wealthiest men in Maryland, right? Wait a minute. Charles Barrister is one of the wealthiest men in, Amer in Maryland. Charles Carroll of Annapolis is one of the wealthiest men in, Amer in, uh, in Maryland. Charles Carroll, the settler, his father, you know, he inherited his wealth from his father, who crazy wealthy, right? And in league with the, the Calverts, deep. Um, so I was like, well, who is this guy's father? So I tried to do some research on his father, and I couldn't really find much. I did find one reference to a Dr. Charles Carroll as his father, but there was no real information other than that. Like it was like a family tree thing and they traced it back that far. So, but it turns out that Charles Carroll senior, you know, the barrister's father was an O Carroll. All right. And so I, I started to look at the history of the O Carrolls here and it gets really crazy for me here. Uh, so it was a Gaelic Irish clan, which I am not even going to attempt that, <laughs> but I do like, I like this clan clan. <laughs> They're the clan clan. Um, yeah, so uh, from the Middle Ages until 1552, the family ruled an area within the kingdom of Munster, but the last monarch surrendered and regranted, I'm not sure what that means, but regranted to the Tudors, kingdom of Ireland. Now the Tudors, we know, go on to be a line of kings in England and Ireland and um but so you know when I was following this wormhole trying to find out who is who Charles Barrist Charles Carroll Barrister's father was Charles Carroll Dr. Charles Carroll uh so I was reading through this this tutor information a little bit and I don't want to get too deep into it cuz it's crazy you know that I mean and I and again it, it kind of gets resolved away because a lot of this history this Tudor history is romanticized by Shakespeare you know who was commissioned by the last Tudor Elizabeth right so you know there's you know those connections going back the Carols to the Tudors to Shakespeare right I mean to the you know to the works that are going to shape our view of history right um so anyway, I was scrolling through and I, you know, just going through and I have to, you know, I was going through a lot, right? And then I, I come to this, right? The coat of arms of the Tudors, right? And it varies, right? Coat of arms of Mary, coat of arms of Henry the Eighth and the Seventh, and we got the red and white here with Henry the Seventh. But before, before they were sovereigns, there was a bunch of other Tudors. And there was this guy. Look at this look at this coat of arms this is for this guy owen tudor right um i'm not going to go much into him but he is like 
he's like the paternal, I think the paternal grandfather of the Tudor dynasty, if you will. Um, yeah, um, but anyway, look at this crest, right? The red and the white. But then I want to focus in on this helmet here real quick, this knightly helmet. Right now, I don't know how many of you out there watch, you know, watch uh, the videos from the New Earth channel. I'm sure many of you do, if not all of you. I certainly know I do, but I kind of pick and choose my way through there. And one of the videos is about the knights. And if you haven't seen that video, I'm going to try to remember to put a link to it in the description. Um, but go watch that video, right? And in that, it's my, I've watched it like three or four times. It's one of my favorites. Um, and she talks about the knights and how the knights may be like these worm-like creatures living in these giant suits of armor. Right? And how the suits of armor aren't anatomically compatible with the human anatomy, you know? And she points to this specific helmet in one instance, saying that water would be poured down this opening to, to bathe the knight inside or whatever was inside, right? And, you know, it's, uh, you know I love that stuff, you know. Um, you know, uh, different sort of uh, creature, I don't, know, I don't know how to say what I want to think, but, you know, um, different beings living on this earth, you know, um, that aren't human, you know, that idea really it tickles my fancy, and, um, and I'm sure along the way we'll get into discussions about that, you know. Um, but one thing that struck me about this, I noticed, you know, tying it back, or not only do we have the red and white, um, and this night helmet, but this night helmet makes another appearance, and it may make more, but it, it, it brought to mind this coat of arms for this guy, right? George Calvert, the first Lord Baltimore, the Baron himself, right? What's his coat of arms look like? It looks like this, right? The yellow and black, but the same kind of night helmet here. So connecting the Calverts and Tudors in a way that even, even, you know, closer than just serving in his, in, in the court of Elizabeth and uh, James, right? You know, which uh, George Calvert definitely served with Elizabeth, who was, I guess, the last Tudor. So, you know, another crazy connection between the Tudor and the Calvert family that I discovered while looking through the Carroll family. And so the, you know, I don't know, it just gets, I mean, it gets crazy, right? So, um, so that kind of, oh, and I needed to go further in there, I'm sorry. Um, because it gets nuts, right? Um, wait a minute. Yeah, I'm still in the right window. Um, Hey, thanks. Um, wait a minute, which page am I on here? The House of Tudor. I want to be on the O'Carroll page. Where we go. Um, so you have to scroll through. And again, you know, I just kind of speed read this kind of stuff. Um, I can't read what your name is, but thank you. Um, I have to go through a lot of this in this history I'm not getting into, especially with all the, uh, the, the Irish Gaelic, you know, words it's impossible for me to pronounce. But it gets really interesting down here somewhere. Um, oh, did I go past it? I went past it. Sorry, guys. Hold on. I'll catch up. I'll catch up to it. Uh, here. Here it is. Um, so, Charles O'Carroll was in great favor with King Charles II and James I, right, who were not able to restore him his paternal estate in Ireland. So what did they do? They gave him three manors of 20,000 acres each in Maryland, right? 20,000 acres is 60,000 acres or 
what was this? Uh, it's, uh, 240 ish square kilometers of land, which I think is like 150 square miles of Maryland given to Charles O'Connor, who would be the father of Charles Carroll, the barrister, but also then a relation to Charles Carroll, the settler. So when Charles Carroll, the settler, was going over there with his attorney generalship, he wasn't going, and they gave him land for that too, by the way, a couple hundred acres. Um, you know, he was going over there all set. The Carrolls, you know, were all set over there. Not only were they were in tight with James the First, who was also in tight with the uh, the Calverts, the Lords Baltimore. You know, I mean, so that's how you know this this Carroll family, you know, and the Calverts, and going back to the Tudors, this connection here in Baltimore, going through to the Crown, <clears throat> is going to lead directly to the cover up that was the. Uh, the American Revolution, okay? And I'm sure I'm going to I'm going to have to say this every time. I'm not trying to prove anything here. This is just fun speculative theory based on, you know, filtering the removal of the mud through Baltimore, um which is an idea that kind of struck me and so I'm just following it through. I, I'm glad that people seem to be enjoying it and are coming with me. Um So anyway, so now, the Carols are well-established over there. They've got all the land. It doesn't matter. But they're planters, right? And everybody's a planter. But planting is not a fruitful career, right? But it doesn't seem to bother the, the Carols or the Calverts or anybody, you know, that, you know, these plantations aren't paying off. And they seem to be doing just fine with their, you know, I mean, between them, they must have 100,000 acres of Maryland, you know, of Maryland land, right? And so... You know, so he comes back from England after his father dies, leaving him so wealthy, and he starts construction on this estate, this Georgian plantation, um, which is uh, Mount Clare, right? And he marries Margaret Tillman. Tillman? And this is very significant as well. I mean, Matthew Tillman... Um, is a, it was a key player, and again, and once again, names you don't hear about. When you hear, when you talk about the founding fathers and stuff, and you, you think about the, you know, the Washingtons and the Adams and Madison and Jefferson, right? And who could forget Alexander Hamilton? Uh, no one can today, right? You know, which is the one who probably should be forgotten, right? You know, and I'll talk about that in a minute too, or not in a minute, you know, eight videos later, I'll talk about that. Um, but he was, look, he was a planter. No, a planter. Get out of town, right? A revolutionary leader from Maryland. You know, these planters in Maryland with their dignitaries that go to these continental congresses, you know, there's funny business, funny business. And not only that, and I don't know how much of it I'll get into. So I just, so the information is out there quickly. Uh, Carol, the Bannister's wife here, Margaret Tillman, she's much younger than him and outlives him by many years. Um, but she's important enough because being the daughter of Matthew Tillman and all of these wealthy plantation owners with with family ties and, and who knows what else kind of ties, dirty laundry ties to England and the Tudors and the Stuarts. Um... She gets invited to King George III's wedding. You know, um, so think about that for a minute. You know, all of these revolutionary, and it, and it gets deeper once we get into to uh, Charles Carroll of Carrollton. Um, all of these revolutionary figures go through this this um, Mount Clare. Right, Jefferson goes through there. Washington goes through there. Um, you know, this Tillman guy clearly goes through there. His daughter lives there for crying out loud. Um, all of this stuff is happening in and around Baltimore and Annapolis. You know, which makes me think that 
you know, but when you hear about it, it at least, you know, in your glossed over mainstream history of it, everything comes out of Philadelphia, right? And, you know, but maybe it really doesn't come out of Philadelphia, which, by the way, was originally a part of Maryland when I was talking about those um, disputes between uh, Pennsylvania and the William Penn and, and the, the Calverts, I think the third Lord Baltimore. It was the land that Maryland lost was, you know, uh, Philadelphia and that, you know, sort of southern Pennsylvania land. Um, but maybe a lot of this stuff was under the, you know, un, you know, underground taken care of in Baltimore, and but then above board, you know, the myths, what they needed to sell to the people, you know, is what they put out from Philadelphia. At least that's what that's what I'm rolling with right now. <laughs> um, you know, because all of these, it's sick. The, the way they go through there, right? And um, so, again, wealthy, wealthy guy. And then there's one other aspect of him I want to talk about, too. And then we'll get into Charles. And then what I'll probably do is I'll check my timer, but I think I'll stop this episode because I went to his house and I did the tour. And there's some interesting things there that I want to uh, go in. And then we'll do I'll do the tour. But I wanted to discuss this. Because again, this is when I when I came across this piece of information, this is where it all clicked for me in that the framers of the revolution, the, the framers of the American democracy as it was represented in our history books, comes right out of Mount Clare. It comes right from here, or or maybe not. It comes right from here through Charles Carroll Barrister and his uh, right here. It says in the early 1760s. Carroll took the lead and encouraged a group of business associates to build a fund for a young saddler. Man made saddles in a stable somewhere, so they this is what this the myth is, you know, so that he could go to Europe and study painting. Now, who is this guy? Who who would they send over to paint uh, to learn painting? Charles Wilson Peel. Okay, this guy is best remembered for his portrait paintings of leading figures of the American Revolution. If you want to create the myths, if you want to create a legacy for the future down the line and you are only planning on leaving them limited information, pictures are the way to do it. Paintings are the way to do it. This guy, if I, I don't know if they give the number in this webpage, but the, the tour guide at Carroll Manor said this guy painted over a thousand portraits of the founding fathers throughout his career. A thousand. All right. He was the one. He created the look. Right, and let's see if if uh, I can get into that here at all. Um, his career as a painter, they say. I think it was maybe it was a Jefferson. Uh, they say so at one point that he was Jefferson's favorite. And Jefferson liked sitting for him best. Right, he did. Uh, he did portraits for Varnum, Benjamin Franklin, John Hancock, Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton. You know, um, is best known for his portraits. So I'm sorry, of George Washington, right? And Washington was close with the Carrolls, right? Um, Margaret Tillman, uh, or the Tillmans are related. I've, I've forgotten the connection there. I probably I might touch on it again, catch it again, catch up with it again some other time. But there's, I mean, it's it's disgusting. You know what goes in and out of of um mount clair you know and it's this guy painting all these paintings you know uh he was prolific they said like i said um uh, he did close to 60 60 just of washington alone right you know um so again i i just want to stress that this is this is what makes me believe that the Carols were instrumental in forging American history and not forging like building, but forging as in like, you know, uh, how do I want to put it? Not counterfeiting, but, you know, uh, creating from whole cloth this concept of the, the war for independence you know, when there wasn't any war. All of these buildings were starting to get uncovered. The technology was getting better, perhaps. Things were coming, you know, the the work was paying off that these families, the Carols and the Calverts and stuff had, had started on, you know, and perhaps some of these other plantation owners, like Jefferson and, and Washington were, you know, again, I'm not, I'm just going through Baltimore here. So that's what made me think. It's like, yes, 
Right. If you wanted to sell the future on what you're pitching today, you know, you needed to leave things behind. And what better things to leave behind than paintings? You know, and this guy did over a thousand of them. And he came right out of the Carroll estate and Montclair here. Okay. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap it up with this, this edition here. And we'll continue on with the tour of Montclair in the next one. And then we'll get on to uh, Carroll, Carroll, uh, Charles Carroll, Carrollton, and John Carroll. And what I really think the Catholics were up to and what they were looking for over here. Okay, so um, thanks for staying with me, guys, and, and tuning in. Uh, if, if you guys like what's going on over here, please like, share, and subscribe. I'm having a good time with it, even though it's convoluted and crazy. And But, you know, we're getting there. I'm making some progress now, and uh, I'm looking forward to where this is going to go. And so until the next one, cheers, guys.